standing if you if you can if you need to have a seat just, just do who has believed our report to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground he has no form of comeliness and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs, our sicknesses, and he's carried our sorrows and pains yet we esteemed him stricken stricken by God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed There is power in the name of Jesus. There is redemption in the name of Jesus, the Christ. There is healing in the name of Jesus. And He has given you and I that authority to represent Him and to destroy the works of the devil. Not only in your life, but as well as in the life of others. There's power in the name of Jesus. Because he is resurrected from the dead, and you and I benefit from the resurrected life. For that, if Jesus never did another thing for you, that's good enough for me. Is it not good enough for you? But you know what? He doesn't stop there. He'll do anything that it takes to perfect you and to come after you. And I love that song that it's sung that He'll go over any wall or any mountain or I don't know what all those other things are that is said in that in that wonderful song but he has a passion for you and desires just like you do to have a passion and love for him so this morning we honor him at his table the communion table the table where we remember we remember the supreme sacrifice of his body and his blood but also that he lives and that he lives mightily in his church, in his body, and has given you and I the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And he's given you a new identity. 
You're not the same person anymore. You may look the same, and some people may say, you just look the same to me, but you're different because of that resurrected power, resurrection power that lives on inside of you. Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. And he's saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as oft as you drink it do it in remembrance of me for as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes therefore we need to examine ourselves we need to apply daily the sacrifice that was made in the grace of God we need to apply it daily through repentance and through a clear conscience of knowing that God loves you and that what he began in you he will perform it until you stand before him you see we we definitely don't want to take the Lord's body and His blood in an unworthy manner. But you know what the truth is? If you're born of the Spirit of God, He made you worthy. Not by your own account, but on His account. <laughs> he made you worthy. Would you bow your heads? Father, in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior, anointed one. We come to you today and we're able to approach your throne of grace and receive mercy and help in every time of our need. But Lord, we don't just come today for that alone. We come to honor you. We come to thank you for the penalty that you paid you paid a debt that we could never pay. And you did it all. You did it all. Even though your creation had rejected you, you did it all so that we would not be rejected. So that we would be justified just as though we had never sinned. Lord Jesus, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for a new identity. Thank you for Holy Spirit that dwells in us we remember you certainly and now Lord as I lay my hands on these cups and this unleavened bread I speak it's sanctified because you have made it sanctified and holy and acceptable for this time God for us to remember you in Jesus Christ holy name I pray amen and amen
Now, if this little cup is your first time, there's a little clear wrapper on the top. Just peel that back, and we want to take the Lord's body, this unleavened bread that represents the Lord's body first as one body. Let's lift it up to the Lord right now. And Father in heaven, we take this in honor of you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's take it right now as one body. you'll peel back the second portion. It's kind of got a little break thing on it right there to make it easy for you. Just easily peel that back. Hold on to it. Let's raise this the cup of the Lord. The blood of Christ that was spilled for you and I. We remember you, Lord Jesus. Let us take it together as one body. Somebody's being healed right now. quick announcement before they go but next Sunday praise God we're going to start for the first time back uh, what we used to call children's Sunday school at 9:30, uh, but it's called disciple makers for children so we will have that in the, 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 the Sunday school room that the children's always had 
But we'll have that. Then right after that, they'll come back in here. We'll worship together. And then we'll have children's church. So let's lift your hand toward all of our kids and our children's pastors this morning. Father, we bless them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that their hearts and their souls are open to receive the implanted word of God. We bless them today in the name of Jesus Christ and also for our children's pastors, God, that they would just teach them the remarkable things of you, Lord Jesus Christ, that changes their lives forever, that gives them a purpose and an identity, God. In Jesus' name, we bless them and release them. Amen and amen. God bless you. Y'all go. Let's give them a hand as they go. Amen. I've got the microphone. We're having a picnic after church for the children and their parents at the city lake immediately after the service today. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. They're ordering pizza? Yeah, and the parents need to be there for their children. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And the parents need to accompany their children to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Food for everybody. I like the sound of that. Okay, I've just got a quick announcement. I want to get right into the Word of God. How many remember hearing something about the stand? Well, four of you. How many's been to the stand? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hey, it's wonderful. Well, don't miss it tonight. And also... If you haven't invited somebody, I mean, this is an outreach for people that won't usually come to a building like this. But you know what? If you tell them about the love of Jesus and that there's a place for them to come and hear about a a, a, a receiving a life change, it's like a lot of people in our world their lives are just not getting it, you know? It's not working too well. I have found in Christ, all things work together for the good. Amen? Even the storms and, and mountains that sometimes we may face, all things still work together for the good of those that love the Lord, those that are called according to His purpose. And if you've been born of the Spirit of God, guess what? You're the called. Can somebody shout, I'm the called! That sounds pretty weak to me. Let's do it again. I'm the cold. Oh. You, you, sometimes you just think pastor's trying to mess with you. That it's not cooth and it's not cool. No, I'm not. And, I, and you're going to learn why this morning if you listen, you know, to the, to the message. Um, but you don't want to miss tonight. Uh, a longtime friend... And uh, someone that I didn't know years ago back in the, I guess you'd say the 80s. And and I only stopped there just a few times because I thought, you know, I don't know about that place right there, but I was pretty hungry. But I'm going to tell you, when I first time I stopped at the Green Top Barbecue, how many knows where that is on on the way to Birmingham? Man, I'm going to tell you what. I just, I knew I shouldn't be eating that kind of stuff, but I just couldn't resist it, you know? (laughs) That stuff's good. That barbecued pulled pork with the green top sauce on it. I'm telling you what, and some of them fries, it was about that long and about that wide and thick. It was nothing like it. Well, he was working, I think, during that time behind the counter there, but I didn't know that man. But you know what? God got a hold of him, and he was born of the Spirit of God. 
changed his entire life. He went off to ministry school. You know, it was serious. It was a serious, life-changing experience. He absolutely had an encounter with God, and this man was changed miraculously, and he just left and went to ministry school, and he heard the call of God, and he's pastored for many years, and now he's evangelizing and just going everywhere. God will open a door, and his name is uh, Brother Preston Hedrick. Hedrick, how many of you know him? Amen. Yeah, we got a few here that knows Brother Preston. How many know about his past life? Yeah, there's a few of us here too. Well, you know, he's not the same anymore. Amen. Amen. And you're also going to be blessed tonight to, to, to not only hear the gospel and the preaching power of Evangelist Preston, but also Joy Babb is going to be here tonight leading worship. I've heard this woman one time, and she's just an amazing prophetic worship leader. Just, I mean, just love being in her presence. And uh, so you don't want to miss tonight. It's going to be great. But the most important thing is you want to bring somebody with you. It starts tonight at 5 o'clock, and I do understand that we're going to be having Green Top Barbecue. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> For Green Top Barbecue. Amen. Well, that's good stuff. Well, good morning to you, and good morning to all those that have joined in via live Facebook this morning. God bless you. Uh, let us pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I decree and declare this morning the devil will not steal any of the seed and that we will truly know, we'll leave this place knowing our true identity and for some maybe, their identity will be restored. And for those that don't know you, they'll receive your identity today, their true identity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to read just, I, I can't get away from the, the eighth chapter of the book of Luke. And I just want to quickly go over that to kind of set the stage. And then I want to just dump jump right in here uh, I guess if you had entitled the sermon today and I didn't entitle it until yesterday sometime but it was just like it was just so relevant to this message identity theft restored identity theft restored how many knows that Jesus is the restore of your identity he gives you a new identity when you're born of the Spirit of God, but He can also restore your identity when the thief comes to steal it. Now let me read this in Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 26. And they sailed to the country of the Gadarians, which is opposite Galilee. And when He stepped off the land, there met Him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long, long time. And he wore no clothes. In other words, he was naked. If you was from Winston County, we call that naked. He was buck naked. Buck naked, okay? Nor did, nor did he live in a house. In other words, he was a naked man and he was homeless. And he lived among dead things, the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Jesus did. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. You see... This man had lost his identity as a human being. He was not saved. He was not born again. But he had also lost his identity as a human being. How many know that the Word of God says that all human beings are created in the image of God? Every, every single person. This man lost his identity. He lost his purpose. He lived with rejection and he had no belonging. He was dead, completely dead on the inside. And he was in a dry and thirsty place. 
Jesus said in John 10, 10, we hear this so often that it becomes familiar. We cannot seem sometimes to get revelation of what it really means. And it's like, well, I've heard that before. I know everything. Let me tell you something that may shock you. When you get to a point to where you think you know everything and you're unteachable, you are someone that the enemy is trying to steal your identity. Listen, the thief, the devil, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you may have life and that, and that you may have it abundantly. You see, I believe two main things that the devil is after. It doesn't matter whether you're a believer, you've truly been born of the Spirit of God, or you haven't ever been born of the Spirit of God. He is after your identity, and he is after your purpose as a witness. Identity and witness. If the devil can steal that, he has rendered you ineffective. You're an effective per ineffective person. You know, and that doesn't mean, oh, pastor, it seems like you're trying to condemn me. No, I'm trying to wake you up with the Word of God. You see, how many's noticed there is a very serious problem in our world today, and it's identity theft. That's the same thing that Jesus is warning His own disciples is that the thief will steal your identity if you don't know and believe me of who I say that you are. You see, identity theft, it's a crime which an imposter obtains key pieces of your personal information to steal your credit or your credit card. Like once my credit card was stolen, Bonnie and I was on a trip out west, and all of a sudden I got this crazy uh, message, and, and then I get a call, and I'm like, hey, your, your credit card has been stolen. Uh, you use this at such and such a place, but hey, uh, we got this. Uh, the person that stole it was acting as you and has used it, and they were like 20 bucks here, 50 there, 75 over here, 100 here, 10 here. They were very subtle in what they were doing. You know, if they had hit 1,000 here and 1,000 there, you know, it had been stopped quickly. But you know what the words that I loved that they said? Hey, don't worry about it. We got this. None of this will be charged back to you. You won't have to pay this. Isn't that just like how Jesus keeps you, amen, and looks after you and I? You see... They, the, the, the thief comes, our identity theft is to steal something of your identity to react as if though they were you. And, and, and identity is defined as your distinguishable character of who you are. Did you hear that? It's, it, it's your distinguishable character of who you truly are. Boy, it's getting awful quiet in here. You see, a person who steals one's identity commits a crime. It's called fraud, which means the intentional perversion of the truth by misrepresenting and deceiving for the purpose of stealing your legal rights. And it's called identity theft. Can somebody say that? Identity theft. However, when you were saved, born again, you were given a new identity. But unfortunately, so many people keep reacting to who they used to be. Let me remind you this. You're, you're no longer the same. Actually, that person you used to be is dead and buried with Christ. Dead. You don't exist anymore. And so when the devil tries to steal your identity, the greatest thing you could do is to tell the devil who you are in Christ Jesus. And hey, buddy, uh, you know, you go back to where you came from. I resist you. How do you resist the devil? You resist the devil with the Word of God. You used to be was changed. Well, how come I don't feel no different? Let me tell you why you don't feel any different. Your, your, your life and your identity is not based on feelings. Your identity is based on facts. Your identity is based on the facts of who God says that you are. 
And when you renew your mind, in other words, when it's a daily process in you, and listen, your pastor, I didn't pass this out to be cool or to say, looky here what I've got. This is what God gave me 11 years ago for this church and everybody that I counsel with, everybody that I witness with, every person and probably half of you have already received one of these. And if you did, the, uh, or you might have lost it or thrown it away, but you got another one. I would suggest that you keep this in your Bible and because your pastor has to pray some of these every single day. And guess what? I have seen people delivered, set free by just sitting there and telling them the same thing that's on this page because you know what? The Word of God works and it saves and it delivers and sets people free. People need to know who they are in Christ. You're born of the Spirit of God. A miraculous thing has happened. You're not supposed to be the same anymore. The old life is gone. Where's the new you? You just haven't let the new you out. How do you let the new you out? By breathing and living and speaking the Word of God. Amen. See, when you were saved, there should have been a tremendous change in your life, your lifestyle, and a definite change in your character. If there wasn't, then you may have just said a, a prayer that mama or grandma told you to say, and you wasn't serious about it. You may have just walked the aisle because somebody told you to, and you wasn't really drawn by the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because see, nobody can come to the Father unless... He draws them. Draws them how? By the conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment that you need a Savior, that you see yourself lost, and that, you, that, that, that you're broken on the inside and you see your condition and oh my goodness, but you see that there's a Savior that loves you, that paid the penalty of your every missing the mark in this life and that He has come to give you a brand new start and a fresh new life and a new identity. So many people have signed the card that was, I mean, I've even had people tell me, you know, when you baptize me, am I going to be a member of the church? Because the last time I was baptized, I, 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 that, that, my baptism meant that I was baptized into that denomination. That is a bunch of, I mean, it, it, it has no meaning. At all. Why in the world would some of the major denominations of America uh, uh, use baptism into Christ as becoming a member of Christ's church? Listen, when you got saved, the Holy Ghost baptized you into the body of Christ immediately. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you didn't even get wet. There's got to be a change. And if there's no change, you may not have been truly born again. Or the devil stole your identity. See, your old character identity changed to the character and identity of God. This change was a spiritual change that took place on the inside, my friend. And will it'll translate to the outside. It's supposed to come out of you if it was real. If your encounter with Jesus and repentance was genuine when you called on Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, then you received a new identity as God's child. And guess what? If you're God's child, you got rights. <laughs> you got rights. You have rights. My friend, your spirit was made alive at salvation. You were changed and reborn. Your part is renewing your mind with the Word of God. And if you believe it, you're going to speak it. If you believe it, you're going to speak it. And you will speak it daily, your new identity in Christ, by saying what the Word says about you. That is every scripture, to my knowledge, in the Word of God that tells you who you are. And see, I've been chosen and God des desires me to bear fruit. And the devil says, that ain't true. I'm a personal witness of Jesus. And then the devil will say, when's the last time you ever witnessed? At, and that's a lie. I am God's co-worker. 
And the devil says, no, no you're not. What, what have you done? I'm a minister of reconciliation. I'm quoting scriptures here. This is not my ideas. I'm raised up with Christ. Boy, you don't look like it to me. You see how the devil is so subtle in your mind to lie to you, trying to steal your identity. And if you believe that junk, you'll never do anything. You'll just hang on to the hair of your chinny chin chin and think, you know, I'll be glad when this is over and I'll just make it to heaven. But if God didn't save you for you to be miserable. He saved you to, for you to be valiant, a valiant water, warrior. We sing these stories that God is raising up an army. You're an army of God. We've sung that song here so many times. Well, an army of God looks like an army of God, speaks like an army of God, is empowered like an army of God. And you know what an army of God does? Reconciliation, witness, giving, sowing, bringing in the harvest. You see, I'm convinced that many in the body of Christ live defeated lives and never have experienced the abundant life Jesus has promised because they still don't know or believe who they are as new creations in Christ. You see, one of the most important things that you could do from this point on, if you don't do anything else, I'm going to tell you, if you use this in your prayer life every day, this would take you probably the rest of your life to pray. And you don't just read it. Now, that's why I pass these out. I want you to take these home. You don't just read it and say, well, you know, that's pretty good, but that sure ain't me. You're right there agreeing with the devil and it's stealing your identity. But you know, when you get in your prayer closet with the Lord, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus today. And you tell God what you need. And you ask, seek, and knock. And you're... you're, you're you're there. You're showing up for God. You're showing up and having that intimate relationship with God. And, and some people tell me, well, Pastor, I've prayed. I don't really know what to pray. Instead of begging God for what He already wants to do in your life, you start speaking the truth about who you are and the assignment that God has given you and the identity. And then all of a sudden, with all of these Scripture verses, you say like this, and I'm just giving an example here, Father, Okay. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I decree and declare this day that I've been chosen by you and your desire for me is to bear much fruit. Father God, I'm your witness. Father God, I'm your co-worker. Father God, I'm a minister. I'm a minister of reconciliation. I, Father God, I decree and declare today that I'm alive in Jesus. I'm your workmanship. I'm near to you because of the blood of Jesus, Father. I have peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm a holy temple that houses the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, I'm full of your glory. Father, I'm, 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 I am mature spiritually. Oh, yeah, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Religion will say, well, if you, you stay in it for at least 40 years, you might be mature, mature. Listen to me. I know some mature youth that is a whole lot more uh, mature than a lot of folks that's been in for 40 years. Amen. I mean, it's the truth. It's the truth. You know why? It's up to you. It's up to you and I. You can choose maturity to be this, to take this long, or you can choose it to, to take this long. It's up to you. So you, you, you pray these scriptures. You put yourself you, personal in these scriptures, and you pray. This, I am convinced, is the highest form of prayer. Instead of begging God for what He already wants to do, you decree and declare who you already are, and then act accordingly in the name of Jesus. You see, the truth is, the more you believe and speak your identity in Christ, the more your behavior and your circumstance will reflect your identity. If you're always gloom, despair, and agony on me, I'm not trying to belittle the storms and the trials of life and the mountains that we face. I've had some myself. May have some in the future. But every time we face a storm, what does Jesus say? And what do we say? What are you doing? Are you asleep again? Do you not care that, we're, that I'm perishing, Lord? 
No, Jesus says to me, I've already given you the example. I did it for you. That's just not because I did, I did it as a man and I did it for you. Yes, I was asleep because I have the peace of my Father living in my heart. So I'll get up from my rest and, I, and watch me. Watch me, the Lord says. I want you to watch me, my disciples. And then he speaks to the storm without. And he says, be still in my name. And it was come. He did that for their benefit because he said, where's your faith? The, the word of God says that, the, that we must live by faith. That is the power of God. The, uh, the, the, the reacts to the Holy Spirit of God, the dunamis power uh, we, you know, on the inside of us. That no matter what the circumstance is, we keep speaking God's word into it, believing it. And if you believe it, you're going to speak it. Can somebody give God some glory in the house? You see, the devil wants to keep you in the dark. Even a Christian. By you not believing who the word of God says you are, so that he can control and manipulate your life and keep you weak and anemic spiritually. If he can steal your identity or if you don't believe who you are in God. You see, truth is Satan fears the believer who knows and speaks their identity in Christ and will exercise your spiritual authority that God has given you. How are you going to exercise it? By speaking who you are. And if you speak who you are, it's the truth. This is not faking it till you make it. You speak words of life. Remember, these are words of life, not death, that gives you life of God that it actually reacts to the life of Holy Spirit that's inside of you so that that river of, that river of living water can begin to flow from your heart. That's how, that's how that those mountains are destroyed and those flood waters that flood your mind of the enemy. The way that Jesus defeated the devil was using the Word of God. Read it as in Matthew chapter 4. You see, as long as a believer is in the dark to their identity, they will wander around in the wilderness and just accepting whatever comes their way. And just saying, well, this is about as good as it's going to get, I reckon. And then you'll start believing a lie. I guess God don't love me. You see, my friend, if you are a disciple follower of Jesus, you are to walk in the light, not darkness, nor deception. You are light now in this dark world. That is great and wonderful part of your identity is your light. Well, I already need that. Can you not give me some deep revelation? Let me tell you how deep this is. So many people in our culture today for the last 40, 50 years they want deep revelation. Deep. No, that's not true. Let me tell you how deceptive that is. If you don't know the deep revelation of who you are in Christ and that you are the light of this world, there's no reason for you seeking another prophetic word or going somewhere seeking something that makes you feel good for only a short while that you're just back in the same old condition again. That's the truth. It's time that, that we get fresh revelation to, to know, hey, I'm the light of the world. I thought that was Jesus. No, it was Jesus, but now he said, you and I are light. Oh, pastor, give me something deep. That's about as deep, my friend, as you can go. To realize that I'm light and you're light. We're the lights that puts out darkness. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 14. You are the light of the world. You and I are the lights in this world. I mean, that really makes me feel good. And when I don't feel good... When I decree and declare that, I start feeling good. I'm going to tell you, some days I have bad days. I'm just going to be honest with you. And you know what? My wife, Bonnie, she tells me, you need to go upstairs. You need to get in your prayer closet or go get in a car. Go somewhere and get along with the Lord and start decreeing and declaring who you are. Works every time. 
Every stage, and I'm not preaching a magic formula here. I'm just speaking what the truth of the Word of God says about my identity, that I am the light of the world. Father, I thank you today. You know, you see, faith that's true faith will react accordingly to the Word of God in the middle of a storm. When you don't feel like it, or when you're facing a, a, an obstacle or a mountain that just seems so impossible. That's true faith. You want to know how much faith you got? then just wait till you go through something that's hard. Because Jesus didn't promise you and I a tiptoe through the tulips. He didn't. But he said, I've overcome, and now I've called you as an overcomer. By what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You know what the word of your testimony is? Only a small portion of that is, and it's powerful, of what Jesus has done for you. But when you research... Uh, 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 Revelation chapter 12 and 11 it's talking about the word of your testimony being this right here of who God says you are and what you have that's what it means it's not like well I'm Benny Knight you know I was born again in 1973 and I come from this and I come from that look what you that, that's a great part of it but really the word of God is talking about the word of your testimony is being what you speak according to the word of God can somebody give God some glory for that listen to this so in Matthew 5 and 14, now listen at verse 16. So, so let your light so shine before people, men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If you have right identity in Christ, your light is going to shine no matter what darkness may come. You will put out that darkness. And everybody will see that light. And they will be good works, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, meekness, self-control, temperance. All of that will come out of you within a dark time that puts out that darkness. And you know what? People look at that and they say, my goodness, I want that. I want that. I want that. And see, the testimony of a lot of people on the outside, the reason they don't come to services like this is that the devil has stole their identity or they see our identity that we're exhibiting on the outside of these four walls and they say, hey man, I'm doing just as good as you. <laughs> I mean, I'm even doing more prosperous than you. I mean, <clears throat> my wife's loving me, you know. My, my children's loving me. I, I got a roof over my head. I got a nice vehicle. And I got money in my pocket. Work at a great place. Why should I want to follow you? As you're telling me you're following Jesus? It's a sad story. But listen to the word again. You are the light. When people on the outside begin to see the glory of God on the inside of you and I, that we begin to let that light so shine to the world and see the good works from the Holy Spirit, they'll begin to want what you and I have. Yeah. It's the truth. It's the truth. You know, Satan is the ultimate identity theft. He doesn't want you to know who you are in Christ. That is why he brings every hindrance to keep you out of God's word. I talk to so many Christians and I ask people behind closed doors. I don't want to shame anybody or, or call people, make people feel worse than they already feel. How many, when's the last time you've been in the word of God? Very few people even read the word anymore. And... and When's the last time, and, and, and I'm not saying this like, you know, this is like law and, and this is like, listen, if you, if you want, I mean, we can holler and scream and sing these songs about intimacy with Jesus. I just talked to a pastor this week. Uh, I, I had the privilege of preaching at Winston County Courthouse in, in the new court building. It was pretty cool. And uh, we, we had an awesome time up there. And, and there were some pastors there. And, and, and I don't know how this come out. All I, all I can blame it on is the Holy Spirit. But it was good. I was enjoying it. And they must have. And I said, pastors, uh, l l let, me, let me tell you where we are right now. Do y'all believe that prayer and, and intimacy with Jesus is really needed in the body of Christ? And I said, let me prove it to you. Next time you have a prayer meeting, count how many people comes. <sighs> it's like 
we've already done that. And then only certain people will come if they can lead it. You, you ever notice that? Oh, there'll be, other, there'll be folks that show up if you'll let them lead it because they're more spiritual than you are. And we've got to that level. And see, we don't want to be a part of it if we can't lead it. I remember a time, oh yeah, you're just old-fashioned. Let me remind you of this. There's a, I, I can't put my hand on it right now, but there's a scripture, uh, I believe it's in, the, it's either in Isaiah or Proverbs, and if, you'll, if you want to know where that is, make you a note of it, come to me, and I'll Google it, okay? <clears throat> and I'll show you where that scripture is. But that we are supposed to embrace traditions, not of religion, but traditions of the Word of God that truly works. I remember a time when people came to meet together and before anything was done, the pastor of the church just came and fell in the altar on his face. And did you know when that happened? There was the whole church. I mean, you couldn't get... And this happened over and over. It, and it wasn't a revival service called a revival service. It wasn't a special prayer service. And people of God, I mean, it sounded like a beehive. People fell on their faces toward God and an altar. You couldn't step over anybody. It was so thick. And I'm talking about in the 70s and 80s, I experienced this. And it's like, oh my Lord, such a humbling experience. And people were crying out to God to bring an awakening. Revival, restore America, even back during that time. How much more is it needed now? Did you know one way that we can make a stand? Is begin to stand in prayer by humbling ourselves before God. And pray again. Pray again. You see, Satan's purpose is to keep you and I in the dark. What are some of the things that will keep you in the dark? Ignorance. Ignorance of what? Hosea 4, 6 is quoted very often that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That knowledge there is not only reading the Word of God, but is a Hebrew word that also means intimacy with God in relationship. Not just knowing about but turning it in to a personal relationship. You see, the word and the tax, the, the, the word say ignorant of what? The word. God, the devil doesn't want you to know what the word says, much less your uh, identity. You see, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, <clears throat> Paul says, lest Satan should take advantage of you, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know what his devices are? Schemes, wiles, fiery darks, which are thought projections. That every time you speak something like this, the devil wants to tell you that's not true. Look at you. Who do you think you are? Well, you've got to resist the devil, and he will flee by doing what? By using the Word of God. It's that simple. We need new revelation of this. We really do. You see, a few other things that will keep you in the dark and allowing the enemy to steal your identity is an unteachable spirit. If you think, and I'm serious about this, if you think you know everything, then you're deceived. And I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I'm, I'm open. I'm open to learn something new if it's true and if it's taught in the Word of God. And I'll sit and listen for somebody to explain that to me. I have begged for that kind of help. I'm open. I don't think I know everything. But I know the one that does. And so do you. Another thing that will steal your identity from the devil's still is a lack of interest. You're just not interested anymore. I done done it all. Didn't do anything for me. Enthusiasm or concern for the things of God. Other things that hinder and steal your identity is unbelief. Doubt, lack of faith in God's Word. Well, you, you, you said it at an altar Sunday, and it just didn't happen by next Sunday. 
You know what I've learned in my, own, my personal life for that? And I believe God answers every prayer if you mean it with all your heart and it's spoken by the word. As I believe if God had given it to you right then, and some people get it right then, but it's all up to God and here's why. He is a loving father that if he answered, he wants to answer the prayer right on time so that you don't lose what's given. You understand that? That you don't lose what's been given. I mean, it would be like you, and I'm just going to pick this, uh, it'd be like you giving your 12-year-old son or daughter a 1969 Pontiac GTO four-speed in the floor with a 357. I don't even know if that's, Brother Lane, what was put in them, but that's, that's a cool car. You know? Yeah, just take, here's the keys. Well, they may have asked for that when they was 12, and they might get one when they're 39 because they couldn't handle it. <laughs> I remember my dad, um, the first car I ever wanted, there was two cars I wanted. Johnny Hood's dad owned one of them, James Hood. And that was a, uh, a black, I believe it was a Chevelle. Yeah. And it had that four-speed in it. And, man, it would run. I mean, just... And it had those glass packs or open packs or whatever you used to call them. You could hear it coming for a mile away. And, and it had a good price on it, too. And I just got 16 years old, and I went and told my daddy, I said, I found my car. He said, yeah, what is it? I said, James Hood's car, you know, that black Chevelle he's got with the four-speed and the floor and all that. This just lying. He said, that ain't your car. <laughs> Are you crazy, son? You'll get killed in there. And I probably, you know, might have. It just wasn't wisdom for me to have. My neck, my second car I ever wanted. So this is Pastor Appreciation Month. If somebody's got one of these in your garage, I'll take it. Uh, was a Triumph TR6. I remember the day you could buy one of them for a little less than $5,000. Well, I didn't get that either. Even when I was 17. But you know what I did get? When I got up to go get my car, because I wasn't mature enough to receive it. This is the point I'm trying to make of what I really wanted later that I could get today because I know better today. I have matured in my driving. Well, I went, we got up Saturday morning, and Daddy said, you ready to go get your car, son? I said, yeah, Daddy, I'm ready. Because, see, two weeks prior to that, we had stopped down at Jasper. They used to have this place that had sold Volkswagens and also Carmen Gears and Triumph TR6s. And I said, yeah, Daddy, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready to go, man. So we got up early, and we came from need more because we needed more of anything that we could get. And we are riding down the road, and all of a sudden, we come around where Rocky Ravine Park is, and Daddy pulls in there to the left. I said, what are you doing, Daddy? He said, we're going to get your car, son. I said, my car's in Jasper. And he said, no, you just think it is. You just think it is. So we pulled in behind Preacher Whitman, I think was his name. We pulled in behind his house, and I saw this old pitiful blue-looking 1962 Chevy two four-door and it didn't even have bucket seats in the thing. And it was a three-speed on the column. And, and I'm like, cool, you know, I can, I'm a hippie. I cannot drive that. My friends are going to think I've turned on them, you know. And I'm coming out. I'm coming clean. I'm straightening up or something. And I'm radical. I don't need to be driving that. That looks like Ma's car. <laughs> and, and Daddy just looked at me and he said, Son, you better give it a good overlook. Because if you don't take that car... You ain't getting no car. You'll be walking. You know what I said? I'll take it. <laughs> All $325 worth. And I got it with my own loan that he signed my first note. And he told Mr. Walker Sr., I'm going to sign this time, but I'm not signing no more. He got a job at the local hospital making a dollar and nine cents an hour. Glory! <laughs> Listen to this. I want you to hold on for the next few minutes and I'll close. In Luke 8, you remember the story now of the Gadarian? 
the man that lost his identity, he wasn't even born again. He wasn't a Christian. He wasn't a follower of Jesus. But he has, his identity was stolen. We see that perfect picture of this man. He was a human being created in the image of God. He was possessed by a legion of demons. When Jesus asked him his names, when Jesus asked his name, he couldn't even tell his name. The demon spoke for him. You want some deep revelation? A lot of times the devil speaks for you when you don't know who you truly are. When Jesus asked him his name, the demon spoke. The man was gone so far down, he couldn't even answer why he had no identity. He had lost it. Actually, every one of this man's actions was out of character for a human being. Listen to this. The man could not... Here, here, here's, the, here's the character of a human being that has no identity that only Christ can give. This man could not answer for himself. You always go to somebody else. And I believe that the Bible teaches that, that counsel is, in the, is among the wise and many wise people. So I believe in counseling. But if you can never make up your mind about anything, and you always have to have somebody else to answer for you all the time, my friend, that's a problem. That is an absolute problem. This man had no purpose or usefulness for living at all. This man was miserable. He was tormented day and night in his soul, his mind, will, and emotions. This man was not submitted or accountable to anybody. Why did you have to throw that in there and ruin the sermon? Because so many people, even in the body of Christ, it's all right as long as you just tell them everything they want to hear. But if you ever ask, for any kind of submission, and I'm not talking about some of the submission that, of the wrong kind that we've seen in the body of Christ to use people. But you don't have no respect for people in the body of Christ. Listen, the body of Christ even teaches us, it not only teaches us to submit to the authority, to the leadership in the body of Christ, the, the Bible teaches us to submit to one another. There's no big guys and little yous. We're to submit to each other. Why? Because we know who we are. Because we know Him. Can somebody give God some praise? <clears throat> you see, this man was not expecting abundant life. He had no life at all. He was tormented day and night just existing when God wanted him to live. Not only was he a lost sinner, he most likely suffered from a spirit of rejection. The scripture doesn't mention any of his family, friends, and his rejection coupled with condemnation, guilt, shame, and regret drove him to fill his soul with other things, trying to fill his void of love, acceptance, purpose, and meaning. And that opened the door to the demonic. This man's story, my friends, relates to a lot of people in our day, both believers and non-believers, alike that are making bad choices that do not agree with or follow God's Word. It's an endless filling of their soul with the wrong stuff, wrong things, wrong people, and it becomes terrible, destructive habits, if not stopped, repented of and surrendered at the feet of Jesus, will cause destruction for it's the devil's plan to deceive. This man in Luke 8 had demons and was tormented in his soul for a long time. He wore no clothes or lived in a home. This speaks of him having no identity, no belonging, no sense of purpose, with no family or friends to love him. He was miserable. Miserable. And I seriously believe he had a broken relationship with his father. Or he didn't even know who his father was. He lived in tombs. This speaks of him living in darkness, being around dead things, lifeless people, a place where no one could keep nor impart life, love, or purpose to him. This man felt that he belonged where he was. He just felt he belonged there. How many of you feel like that sometimes? Well, I guess I'm just getting what I deserved, and I'm miserable, and I just deserve it. That's not true. Nobody! Nobody listen to me. Jesus didn't come to die for you and raise from the dead for you to live a miserable life. 
He said abundant life. It's time that we get a revelation of what that is and it will come to you with your believing of correct identity. He was living in the tombs. Speaks of him living around dead and lifeless people. For us today, it's a place where no one could help or impart life or purpose. He lived with no identity. This man was driven by anger of what he believed this world and others had dealt him. And, and, and see, a person like that, it's always blame. It's the blame game. You blame everybody else. Every, it's everybody else's fault. Well, it's her. I, I know what that's like. I remember sitting in a pastor's office, a counselor, that my past pastor said, you need to go see this pastor over there. He's a good counselor. I don't need to be counseling you because we're best friends. So I went to this counselor, and that dude started telling me some things that I didn't want to hear. And you know what my, my thing was? And I got angry with him. I raised my voice, and I said, listen, if, if you would listen to me, you would understand who's got the problem in this room, and it's her. Not realizing I had been deceived and I was living in sin and I knew it because I had been born of the Spirit of God and then I was trying to put all my guilt, condemnation and shame on her. If you'd straighten up, how many of you have ever said that? You don't have to raise your name or raise your hand or tell me your name. But if you'd just live right, I could live right. If you would be what the Bible says you were to be, then I could be. My friend, I'm going to tell you, that ain't going to work on Judgment Day. <laughs> Whether you're born again or you're not, it's nobody's. You, you, you have to know that yourself. It ain't nobody's fault. I'm not saying that what they did was right. But you know what Jesus said to do with that? Just forgive them. Because if you don't, the devil will deceive you. You forgive them and release them. He felt worthless. He felt useless. He lived in self-hatred with extreme manic depression. He felt that he deserved what he was getting and the life he was living was just about as good as it was ever going to get. He was a cutter. He cut himself. Some of you may be in that. Some of you listening this morning may cut yourself. I've known many people. Counsel with many people. Sister Lisa, you probably as well. You know what a cutter's doing? They hate themselves. They hate who they are. Or they're in some kind of situation that they blame themselves for. And it's a release some kind of release, if they could feel pain, it would stop the pain right here for only a short while. And then they live to do it again and again and again. And it's also a sign of demon. Either demonization or demon possession. Now I'm not saying everybody, that, so don't go out of here saying that Pastor Benny said everybody that cut themselves is demon possessed. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this though. It can be a sign of demon possession or a sign of demonization, of an attachment, even to a believer of Jesus. His anger was his inner pain. He was not only disappointed with life, this man hated himself. Sister Hannah, you want to come? This is the most important time of this service. For you out there, it's not time to get up and get another cup of coffee. If you'll give me about five minutes and give the Holy Spirit about five minutes to speak to your heart for all of you that are in here this morning. That you don't like the way things turned out. If the truth is known, you hate your life. You hate your life. And you're thinking... I've tried to serve God for so many years and this is what I get. And this is just about as good as what I can expect. 
My friend, you've been deceived. That's not God's will. But here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. But when this man that hated himself, that cut himself, that was tormented in everybody in his family and town, feared him. He was possessed with a legion of demons. But when he cried out, he saw Jesus, and he cried out to Jesus, and he worshipped Jesus. He fell at the feet of Jesus and worshipped him. His eyes were open to who Jesus is. This man realized that he couldn't help or save himself. He realized that other stuff, things, people, his choices, and bad habits could never fill the tremendous void of his soul. He needed the Savior to save him to deliver him and give him his true identity and a purpose to live. I want to remind you of something. That Jesus means Savior, Deliverer. Christ means the Anointed One. The only one that can. The Anointed One. The only one that can save, deliver, heal, restore, set free, and give you your true identity and make all things new. And for you to live with purpose and the abundant life is Jesus Christ. He threw himself at the feet of Jesus and that broke demonic chains, strongholds, false identities, and demonic validations. I, I, I hear so many tragic stories of young people and old people alike. And you know what the world is telling them? I just talked to one of those pastors this past Thursday morning. He said, please pray for my friend. I just witnessed to him. He gave his heart and life to Jesus, but he's struggling so bad because he's homosexual. And did you know homosexuality is supported by so many secular groups now? That so many educated groups now? And, and did you know, the, and the story went on and on because I talked to this man about it. And he said, yes, Pastor, he's suicidal. Isn't it strange that that group, the, the group that the devil, well, any group that the devil has deceived to believe a false demonic validation of their identity, they're more prone to commit suicide? See, this is not a sermon about bashing homosexuals or adulterers or fornicators or liars or thieves or whoever that you are right now. This is a message of true identity in Christ that Christ is willing and able to give a person right now that I have seen all of the above according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that, that, that speaks to people in the church at Corinth that you used to be this. But let me tell you who you are right now in Christ Jesus. You're a new creation. That old person you used to be is dead. And now, no matter who you used to be, you're not the same person anymore. I want you to notice that this man fell at the feet of Jesus. This speaks of his full surrender to Jesus as Lord. When he fell at Jesus' feet, the dark chains of the devil broke off and fell off of him. This man worshiped Jesus because Jesus was his Savior, his Lord and Master now. He saw Jesus. He tasted of God's goodness, God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and God's grace. He was accepted. And the end of that story is in Luke 8 and 35 the people of this man's town and I'm sure his family and long distance friends came to see what had happened to the man that was demon possessed and when they came to Jesus they found this man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind and that brought fear into their life. Why? It's because of the miracle that had just taken place. I want to ask you some important questions this morning. Are you chained to your past? Do you know your identity in Christ? Has Satan stole your identity? Do you want to be restored and set free today? Are you saved? 
Have you been truly born of the God Spirit, repented of your sins, thrown yourself at the feet of Almighty God, and asked God for His mercy? Have you been to the cross of Jesus? Have you been washed in the blood and laid down your life to receive a new life in Christ and a new identity? Has the thief stole your identity? Have you, like this man I've talked about today, realized that without the Savior, you are you are eternally lost or outside of God's will and you will always lack purpose. You don't know who you truly are and the life that you've been living you believe is about as good as it's going to get. And do you know right now this moment if you were to die would you be in the presence of God Almighty or would you go to a devil's hell? Yes I said it because this right here says so. And the last question my friends, are you ready to repent? Are you ready to turn from your own way? Are you ready to give up your life to God and become a new person and receive Christ and receive your God-given identity today? Maybe you are saved, but you're out of God's will. You don't think it's time to return right now. Why would you put it off any longer? It is time. The day is the day of salvation. The day is the day that God wants to restore you, validate you with true identity, purpose, and your rightful place in Jesus Christ. Do you want those chains broken today? Then receive your true identity. Would you stand to your feet? In Mark 5, 20, let me tell you about this man. He begged Jesus. He said, can I go with you? I just love you, Lord. Can I go with you? Can I, I just want to be with you now. I, I just want to be in your presence. There's nothing like it. I mean, my goodness. He had a real encounter with God. And he's begging Jesus, please let me go back with you. And listen to what the Word says. So the man started. Jesus said, no, I want you to go back and tell your story everybody that rejected you and tell them your identity in me now. So the man in Mark 5 20, he started off to visit the ten towns of that region he came from. And he began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. Everyone was amazed of the stories that he told. Because it was true validation of a new creation in Christ that they saw. Do you want that this morning? Do you want to start new today? Do you want to be validated in the right way today and reject the devil's validation? God loves you. Would you come to Jesus as Sister Hannah's playing and singing? This altar's open right now for anyone. And the altar's open for you at home this morning to bow right where you are. And I'll say a pr final prayer in just a moment. This way for anybody, anybody that wants to come. You're coming to Jesus. You're not coming to Pastor Ben. and pray and Father God in Jesus name Lord I believe that there's been people here as well as people out there this morning that have received your word and in the name of Jesus Christ I decree and declare that the, that the enemy's chains and false identities have been destroyed and those chains broken today I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, right now where they're sitting and right where they're standing, that they have made you their Lord and Savior, that they've believed in their heart and they've confessed you with their mouth. And now they receive their true identity. Lord, I pray in your name 
that they begin to read the word daily and find out really truly who you say that they are and I, I, I believe Lord that your people will begin to read your word now of their true identity and confess that each day and they'll begin to live that abundant life Lord Jesus that you so promised in your name I pray amen and amen now before you all are dismissed today I want uh, Sister Karen if you will to come forward amen And I want you to turn around and face, uh, well, I'm going to call this your spiritual family this morning. Uh, this is Sister Karen. And uh, can I go ahead and say something about, okay. She said yes even before. I, I might have said something about something else. <laughs> I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, though. But next month, Sister Karen and Brother Danny Brooks will be married on the 21st. Amen. <clears throat> And, and this body of believers are so happy for you and Danny. Y'all are a beautiful, wonderful couple. But Sister Karen wants to unite with this church and be a part of this body, of her spiritual family. And so would you all let her know how much you welcome her this morning to the family of God. Come on, church. Come on, church. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, amen. You see, we don't vote on people here because Jesus has already made that choice. Amen. <laughs> well, God bless you. God bless you and Brother Danny and all your families. So just lift your hands this morning to receive your blessing. And the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord God, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his eternal peace that surpasses all understanding. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that name above every name, I bless you this day in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. See you tonight at the stand at 5 o'clock. Bless you, my sister. We love you. God bless you.